Hello, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Sam Fenler, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host Courthouse Steps Oral Argument, Gonzalez v. Google, featuring Eric Jaffe. Eric is a partner at Share Jaffe LLP. Eric has extensive experience in appeals and has been involved in over 120 Supreme Court matters from filing cert petitions and amicus briefs to representing parties on the merits. Before starting his law practice, Eric clerked for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. If you'd like to learn more about Eric, his full bio is available on our website, fedsoc.org. After Eric gives his opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speaker, not the Federalist Society. Eric, thank you very much for joining us today, sir, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, uh, always happy to come chat and talk about new cases there for the court, particularly ones that I follow and I'm interested in. Um, it's interesting, this case will be interesting. So for, for those of you joining us, I assume you all are roughly familiar with what the issues in the case are, but at the end of the day, the, the primary question is whether or not making targeted recommendations via algorithm or otherwise uh, of content somehow loses immunity under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And Section 230, the relevant part provides that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So the question is whether making a recommendation of somebody else's, in this case, video, somehow loses you immunity under 230 for a claim that says your recommendations meant people joined ISIS and killed my relatives. Um, and so does recommending third party content somehow trigger liability that is different than if you had republished or spoke, the, you know, just, just posted the third party content without a recommendation? Uh, and, and one might ask, why is this something under the Free Speech and Election Law Practice Group? Because there's no First Amendment issue squarely presented. Uh, and that is true. This is a statutory question about the scope of statutory protections. It doesn't ask whether the Constitution covers this. It doesn't ask what would happen uh, if Section 230 immunity didn't exist. But I think there are a whole bunch of lurking free speech issues uh, underneath this, the, these questions. Uh, that make it interesting. And I'll get to some of those at the back end, but let me sort of summarize what happened at the argument today, since this is, after all, courthouse steps. So let's talk about what happened at the courthouse. Um, so the, the argument order uh, at the courthouse was counsel for uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, who was arguing that 230 does not apply to a suit that alleged material support for ISIS by having put their videos in the up next category as a thumbnail. Uh, and then it was followed by a counsel for the United States who argued that he didn't think 230 necessarily applied here, uh, though he did think that there was no decent claim. But at the end of the day, he was sort of somewhere in the middle, um, but, but generally hostile uh, to the notion that 230 would necessarily cover this. Uh, and then finally, counsel for Google, who, of course, argued that 230 does cover this. Uh, and, and the questioning started out uh, for counsel for Gonzalez, Mr. Schnapper, uh, with uh, Justice Thomas, who I think many had been concerned was skeptical of Section 230 and might look for ways to narrow it. And uh, in fact, his questions suggested almost the opposite that he was quite skeptical of the claims that merely popping a video up in the up next category based on an algorithm that said, you seem to like ISIS videos, here's an ISIS video, um, or you searched for an ISIS video, here's another one. Um, he seemed extremely skeptical that that could lose 230 protections for, uh, in this case, YouTube, whose parent is Google. Um, you know, it, it was just interesting. He sort of his, his questioning focused on whether or not the algorithm was neutral as to the content, 
i.e. it treated cat videos in much the same way that it treated ISIS videos or, you know, cooking videos or whether you like Turkish kebabs and Turkish rice pilaf, I think was his example. Uh, and, and I think that's a fair way to look at it. He sort of said, look, if, if the answer is you seem to like cat videos or rice pilaf videos, here's another one. Why is it different when it's ISIS uh, in terms of you're not recommending it, you're just acknowledging what the user of YouTube seems to want. Uh, and, and that seemed to be a recurring theme of his questions where he just sort of didn't see how it was that giving people stuff that was responsive to their past behavior or their requests could somehow make you liable for the fact that they were watching these things. Um, and so that was quite encouraging from someone from my perspective. And fair warning, uh, I had a brief in this case in support of Google. Uh, I think Section 230 uh, would protect the particular behavior in this case. Um, my firm had another brief in the case uh, on behalf of a group called Protect the First and on behalf of Sen Senator San former Senator Santorum, uh, again, arguing that Section 230 applied and generally would protect stuff like this. Uh, again, a pro a pro speech kind of approach. Uh, but that being said, uh, I was quite pleased to see Justice Thomas surprise some observers by coming out uh, seemingly in favor of a, 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 a reasonably robust application of Section 230. Um, other justices, uh, I think on balance, all the justices, uh, in my view, came out fairly pro 230 in this instance and sort of were more skeptical of Gonzalez's arguments than they were of Google's, uh, with a few notable exceptions. Um, in no particular order other than as I sort of wrote down the questions in my observations, so not in order of seniority, uh, I thought the next set of interesting questions um, came from Justice uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who, who I think was a little more in the middle on what she thought the scope of 230 was. At least, certainly at the beginning, she seemed a little more sympathetic to uh, Gonzalez's arguments and was trying to find a line between are you simply displaying it through some sort of ordinary criteria for displaying things, you have to make a choice, or are you encouraging some particular content? Um, at the end of the day, you know, it, it struck me that she was perhaps driving towards this notion of endorsement as opposed to display. Uh, so it's one thing to sort of say, I need to pop something up top, so I'm going to use a bunch of criteria. Does it meet your previous searches? Is it something I think you're interested in? Is it something people like you seem to be interested in? Uh, is it the most popular thing on the web these days? So I'm going to pop that up to the top of your, in uh, of your, of your scroll of possible videos uh, versus Am I sending it to you because I think I agree with it? Uh, and I, I thought at the end of the day, after a lot of questions from her, there were some hints that that may be the line she's drawing. And that's not a, it's not a, 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 a you know, that's not a crazy line at all. Uh, it's, it's actually a line that to some degree, I think uh, Council for Google and even my amicus brief sort of adopted, which said, you gotta ask, are you being held for your content? or someone else's content? And if the answer is, yeah, ISIS made the video, but I said, hey, this is a great video, they got it exactly right, I sort of adopted their content as my own, uh, and then I'm being held for my own speech and my own information content. Uh, and I think she might have been pushing a little bit on that line, but, but didn't quite get there. Uh, but again, I, I thought she was skeptical, and one of the indicia of her skepticism about this, or her at least, uncertainty about how to properly resolve the case, well, she kept asking, well, what happens if tomorrow I decide there's no cause of action here? So just for those keeping track, uh, tomorrow there's, a, there's another case involving similar issues uh, involving Twitter, where the question is, does, does this anti-support you know, anti for terrorists statute, I forget what it's called, JASTA is the acronym, but I forget the exact title. But there's a statute under which this lawsuit was brought that says you're materially supporting ISIS. And the question is, does posting their videos constitute aiding and abetting ISIS? Uh, and so Justice Barrett said, well, what if I decide that the aiding and abetting doesn't reach that far? Do I need to reach the 230 issue or can I just 
uh, presumably dismissed as improvidently granted or remanded with instructions to kick the case out because there's no cause of action regardless of what Section 230 says. And, and to me, that signaled that she finds the 230 issue sufficiently difficult or problematic as to want to find another way to kick the case out. Uh, and she, she at least kept asking the attorneys this question, can I throw it away if I decide tomorrow's case uh, against the sort of the, the plaintiffs? Uh, and pretty much no one said yes to that question. Uh, the answer uniformly was no to whenever she would ask that question. Invariably, they would say something to the effect of, well, you've got to give us a chance to replead, or there wasn't a motion to dismiss, but you need to decide the 230 question first. Uh, so so uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I don't think they're going to sort of kick it out because of how they decide tomorrow's case, but it certainly was an indicia that she's on the fence on this stuff. Uh, the next justice of, of interest, uh, or at least in order of, of how I wrote things down, uh, was Justice Sotomayor, who I think once again was quite skeptical of the attempt to restrict Section 230 to, um, you know, to, to not cover this kind of thing. Uh, and again, she was especially concerned with the interaction between the immunity and the liability aspects, whether aiding and abetting could be found in what was otherwise protected under 230. Um, but, but ultimately, separating out the, is there a cause of action versus is there immunity? Uh, I think she, at the end of the day, was very skeptical that any sort of recommendation can suddenly make you liable for the content being recommended, regardless of the basis of your recommendation. So if the basis of your recommendation was, this seems to be the most popular answer in the world, so I'm going to give it to you first, and that's my recommendation, uh, or, or my, that's my prioritization, she seemed to be skeptical that that somehow meant you had done something live, worthy of losing immunity. Uh, and, and, you know, asked a lot of questions to that effect, again, over and over, sort of pressing upon counsel for Gonzalez in a way that I thought suggested she wasn't very sympathetic to counsel's arguments. Um, the next one was the chief justice, again, also skeptical, lots of questions about, uh, you know, how does this, you know, every, every website seems to work this way. Are you saying that every time we put something first, that's a recommendation. And also, I thought, quite interestingly, worried about the economic ramifications of this, that if these sort of organizational principles of we're going to feed you those things that seem most relevant to you, if we suddenly are going to hold people liable for those organizing choices, uh, that that would apply to everyone, everywhere, every search engine, every website, every moderator, and would have massive economic effects and would be massively disruptive to the internet. And he sort of felt like the court should not be the one choosing to have such a disruptive effect, that that was, that was a choice that Congress had to decide and had to balance disruption versus uh, greater or lesser protection, et cetera. So again, quite encouraging, very, very in keeping, by the way, with Justice Roberts's sort of approach to the world, which is sort of don't blow up the system uh, if, if, if there's another way out. And here we have a pretty consistent set of decisions by lower courts that say this is, this is protected. Uh, and if Congress doesn't like them, Congress can change it. And they seem to be on the ball about noticing this. So let them do it. Don't have the court step in and make such a massive and, and um, disruptive claim. Uh, and I thought that was quite in keeping with his general uh, modus operandi of, of don't have the court become the, 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 the agent of disruption if it doesn't have to. Sometimes it has to, sometimes it doesn't. But here you could see the more natural conservative tendencies uh, showing through. Uh, Justice Kagan similarly seemed um, a little skeptical, though I thought explored some interesting questions about what is the nature of the algorithm? What is the nature of the recommendation? Is the recommendation one that simply says, you seem to like cats, here's more cats. You seem to like ISIS, here's more ISIS. Or was it, golly gee, we really like ISIS and we think you should watch ISIS because we like ISIS. So it's sort of a viewpoint dr driven or content driven recommendation that has an implied message. The message being, you should watch more ISIS because ISIS is good versus you should watch more ISIS because you seem to like ISIS. 
that you know it, one is one's own speech, the other is merely uh, an editing function, or at best, the statement that says, "We want you to watch more videos on our thing. We don't care what they are, so we're just going to show you videos that you seem to like." Uh, so again, I thought she was pretty good. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, again, extremely uh, cautious, again, in the line of sort of Chief Justice Roberts, again, concerned about economic disruption uh, and, uh, you know, all the disruptive effects of this, leaving it to Congress. Uh, I I thought he, again, was quite strong in terms of having a a broadish reading of 230 that wouldn't allow liability simply because you suggested the content that somebody else created. Uh, particularly where the harm from that suggestion is people watch the content and the content made them do bad stuff. Uh, So uh, again, I thought he was quite good. Justice Alito, similarly quite good on the pro 230 side of the fence. Again, quite skeptical, quite skeptical of where you would draw the line. Uh, Counsel for Gonzalez was having a very, very hard time making a coherent distinction about where you would draw the line. Uh, And I'll get to that in a few minutes. But he sort of tried to draw a distinction between, well, you showed them a thumbnail, which you created, and so you can be liable for that. But if you had just popped up the video directly, that's okay. Uh, versus, well, they asked for the video, so you showed them the video, so that's not on you. But if they ask for the video and you show them that video plus one other that's like it, that is on you. He was having an incredibly difficult time drawing a very thin line that ultimately very few of the justices thought made any sense. Uh, and, and, and even his, his erstwhile allies in the United States didn't think his lines made much sense. Uh, and I confess, I, I agree with them. Uh, so then we get to the last two justices, Justice Gorsuch and uh, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. And, and I think there we finally get a little more skepticism of uh, on the 230 side of the fence. Uh, Justice Gorsuch was skeptical only in, in the sense that he was looking for a way to get a remand without having to necessarily give the final answer. Um, But I thought the way he approached Section 230 was interesting, and I sort of agree with him. He, to him, the question was, where is the line between being responsible for your own conduct or your own information content versus being responsible, held responsible, for a third party's information content. And he looked to some parts, some definitions in the statute, uh, again, definitions that I fully agree with that we sort of pointed out in our amicus brief, uh, where he said, look, uh, information content, you know, information service providers, um, they pick, they choose, they digest, they analyze, they, they prioritize, they do all these things to other people's content that doesn't make those things their own content, otherwise, the statute would be largely meaningless. Uh, and I agree with him with that, that, that those things seem to be the functions of information con- of service providers that they're supposed to be allowed to do uh, rather than be responsible and liable for. That's what gets them, triggers the option of immunity. It doesn't detract from it. Uh, but he sort of thought that the real question then is, does YouTube's algorithmic recommendations somehow convert the content, the information content provided by ISIS or by any third party into YouTube's own information content. And to my mind, what he was driving at is, did you endorse the content? Did you adopt the content? Did you say, yes, this content is right and you should watch it? And I think that's the kind of line he was probably drawing, though we didn't get that far down the chain because he was uh, participating by telephone, it sounded like. Uh, So it was a little more difficult for him to follow up on things, I thought. Um, But he kept on looking for, can I just remand to the Ninth Circuit and tell them, focus on content rather than focus on what he described as the neutral tools. Uh, And I think that's interesting. I'm not sure he's he's completely accurate in what he thinks the Ninth Circuit did below in their reference to neutral tools. But the Ninth Circuit sort of had a couple passing references to, well, if the choices are being made by neutral tools, then you can't say that they've adopted it as their own. Uh, And I think that's right. But I think there was a little bit of confusion about what neutral tools means in this content. Obviously, uh, an AI or a computer algorithm theoretically is neutral, though that really sort of depends on how you've programmed it. I suppose if you programmed it to be viewpoint discriminatory or content discriminatory, uh, then it's not that neutral. It's either pro-content or anti-content or pro-viewpoint or anti-viewpoint. And those 
algorithmic elements may help decide whether you're adopting the republished content as your own, or those algorithmic elements may be neutral as to the content, but non-neutral as to other things like, yes, we, we want people to watch us more, so we're gonna give them more that they seem to like. That's not neutral, it's not random or arbitrary. It has, a view, it has an intent, and the intent is simply to give you more of what you want but it doesn't care what you want. So it's neutral as to the viewpoint, but it's not neutral necessarily as to, yes, you should keep using my service. Uh, finally, uh, Justice uh, Jackson was absolutely the most skeptical of the Google position here, basically taking a position that Section 230 was adopted for a very narrow purpose of letting people remove trash from their websites and not be held liable for the trash they missed. So she sort of looks at the interaction between C1 and C2 of Section 230 and says, C1 says you can't be held liable for other people's content. C2 says, and we're not going to hold you liable for removing unpleasant content, you know, libel, slander, offensive content. You know, you get to have some editorial discretion on taking junk down so that the internet is not a complete sewer if you're inclined to help make it not a sewer, or at least so that your web service is not a sewer, uh, but that we don't want you to be liable for taking some stuff down but missing other stuff. And she had this very narrow view of the original purpose of 230 that got a lot of pushback, but would probably not protect Google in this case. So of, of all the justices, she was the one that seemed most sympathetic to Gonzalez's position. Um, uh, I thought, Justice, Justice Barrett and Justice Gorsuch were it, not quite sympathetic to Gonzalez's position, but less willing to go all on board with Google uh, and perhaps get a remand or a dig. Uh, and, and so that was sort of interesting. But, but I, at least by my sort of intuitive spidey sense, I see six votes that sort of says, you know, the theory of the case presented by Gonzalez here, that popping up a thumbnail and says, you seem to like ISIS, here's more ISIS, is not enough to lose 230 liability. That's my, my gut sensation. I could easily see that being 7-2 or 8-1. Um, I can see that being 8-1 on, well, I can, I can see Justice uh, Barrett and Justice Gorsuch writing a concurrence or two that sort of says, I think we should dig this, but at the end of the day, whatever, this is okay, maybe concurring in the judgment. Uh, whether Justice Jackson writes a dissent or not, I don't know. She might write a concurrence for other reasons, but have a narrower interpretation of 230 that lets her you know, deal with other cases in the future in a slightly different way. So we'll see. Uh, so that's where I think the justices are at. Let's talk a little bit about where I thought the lawyers were at. Uh, so going back to counsel for Gonzalez, uh, I thought they chose a line that was incredibly difficult to defend. The line they chose, it seems to me, well, there, there was a theoretical okayness to it, but it just didn't apply to their case very well. So they chose to say that when you create a thumbnail of a video, which is basically a picture with a link in it uh, to a video that somebody else has uploaded to your site, uh, that that is somehow your content and you are now responsible for that content. So if you recall, when I read section 230 to you all, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, or more than a few minutes ago, it said, you can't be held liable as the publisher of the information content provided by another. And the way he's trying to get out of this is by saying, well, the thumbnail isn't information content provided by another, it's information content that you created or at least co-created and hence, you can be held liable for that. Uh, and, you know, pardon my bluntness, but that distinction, the distinction between your information content and their information content is fine. The distinction between I put a thumbnail up versus I just played the video versus I had a static screenshot of their video that didn't have a hyperlink in it, that distinction is idiotic. Uh, and, and look, you know, he's a good lawyer. I'm sure he, he, he had to go back and forth and had a lot of help at moot courts on figuring out this line, but that line is indefensible. The notion that there is a difference between a hyperlink and a screenshot and a thumbnail 
is incoherent within the context of 230, just incoherent. And so that really got him in a bunch of trouble. And tons of people were skeptical about that. And, and it's going to go nowhere. It's going to go absolutely nowhere. Uh, the real question will be, what was the basis for the algorithm? Not what was the format in which the results were displayed, whether they were displayed as a, a video that you asked for, whether they were displayed as a thumbnail, or whether they were displayed as a static screenshot. That's not going to be the line. Um, the other thing he sort of said that was interesting, he said, look, the injury to his clients was not from the ISIS content. It was from the fact that you, you put the thumbnails up there and then people watched it because of the thumbnails. And I don't know that, again, there's a thin line there which says, well, I, they were injured because people watched the underlying video and then liked ISIS, gave money to ISIS, supported ISIS in some way. That, but, but, but the injury was really only from your recommendation, not from the underlying video. Or somehow your recommendation marginally changed the injury of them having watched the video themselves merely because they got more people to watch it. Again, I think that line is largely indefensible and is not going to be uh, something that people rely on. Because at the end of the day, if, it was, if, you, if your algorithm simply said, pop up the most commonly requested answer, and it happened to be the ISIS video, uh, yes, more people would watch it. Uh, again, that is not, uh, you're still trying to hold them liable based on the content of the video. If the content of the video was cats, you, even if it said ISIS on the cover, but the content was cats, uh, then there would be no harm here, right? Not, nothing would have happened. Um, they said a few other things that I thought were interesting. He tried to make the argument that uh, YouTube sort of fed you these videos before you even had it to. So it's a sort of a distinction between reactive versus proactive feeding you of content. Uh, I'm not sure that distinction holds up, but I thought it was at least more interesting. He said, look, if they sent you an email that said, by the way, there's some ISIS content we think you might like, uh, that that might be somehow different than if you got on there and said, oh, I'd like some ISIS videos. And they showed you one and said, here's a bunch of others. But that was somehow different. Again, I think it's a little bit thin distinction. It didn't sort of work for me, but but it was less less incoherent at least. Uh, there was at least a line of affirmative versus responsive uh, feeding you of information as suggesting whose content it really was that you're being held liable for. Um, the final two things that he said that were interesting was one, he tried to limit the damage here because the statute that holds you responsible for aiding and abetting terrorism includes he says includes recommending terroristic uh, content. Uh, and so that this wouldn't be true of most other courts like defamation. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not true, but it was an interesting attempt to narrow this, to make this a very narrow scenario that likely would not happen elsewhere. I thought the other uh, advocates helped make clear that that's probably not the case, that, that there are lots of courts of negligence that could just sort of say, well, you negligently let them see more videos about anorexia or cutting or suicide or any of the things that people say you shouldn't let people watch. Uh, and so I'm not sure he's right that that JASTA, the statute is that unique vis-a-vis -vis other sort of torts uh, out there. Uh, and then the last thing he said, there was a discussion about whether if the definition of an information content or an information service provider so the, the, the triggering entities that are covered by 230, if that defi definition includes folks who engage in selecting, choosing, analyzing, and digesting the content of others, then there must be some difference between doing those things, analyzing, digesting, selecting, displaying the content of others, and creating your own information content which is what YouTube could get in trouble for, right? They can get in trouble for their own information content. If YouTube creates their own video and posts their own video that says, yay, ISIS, donate to ISIS, well, then YouTube is in trouble and they're, they're toast. But if all they do is digest, analyze, and display somebody else's video to that effect, then the argument would go, they're protected. And he said that, that distinction between digesting and analyzing versus creating content only applies to this tiny little piece of, of the definition of an information content provider. Uh, I don't think anyone was buying that. It's a hyper-technical question, but for those sort of Section 230 geeks out there, it was a debate about whether uh, subsection F4 applied to all of 230 or part of 230 because you, know, you provided access software. And access software providers 
are a subset of information content providers. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about that. I just want to flag it for those folks out there that follow that kind of stuff. Uh, it was an interesting discussion. I think uh, the counsel for Gonzalez was wrong about the distinction he's drawing, but there you have it. Uh, so the next advocate was Malcolm Stewart for the United States. Uh, I thought he did a pretty good job, even though I don't agree with his outcome. I thought he did. He was at least talking about the right parts of the statute, which was comforting. Um, he drew this distinction between whether or not you're being held liable for the content, information content of others, third party information content, versus being held liable for your own, for your own choices or for your own content. And I thought that was useful and interesting. It's just in this particular case, I don't think it applies, but I think it was a useful line to draw and it's a good way of thinking about 230 going forward. So I fully agree that 230 does not immunize you for information content that you, the service provider provides. So if YouTube makes their own video, they're screwed. If YouTube, personally, I think, if YouTube adopts and endorses your video, affirmatively says, yes, that's true, we like that, and we agree, and you should watch this, because that's true, well, that's like adopting a libel. Uh, it's, it's one thing to say I'm not gonna hold them responsible just because they reposted your libel. It's another thing for to say I'm holding them liable for endorsing it. Uh, you know, just because you repeat somebody's libel and then endorse it doesn't mean you're immunized. And I think that's about right. Uh, what I don't agree with him is that here, the, the YouTube's conduct is what to display, what to prioritize. But the prioritization decision is not based on endorsement. It's based on unrelated criteria like you seem to like ISIS or you seem to like cats or you seem to watch a lot of these and we'd like to keep you on, on our channel longer. So here's another one. Uh, all of those things are not endorsement, even though they're choices, but those choices are not the kind of choices that amount to in, you know, the harm that they're talking about, uh, material support, for example, or aiding and abetting. So it's where I sort of separate from what the government's position, but I'm happy that the government is indeed focusing on the key words of, are you being held liable for the information content of someone else? Here, of course, the harm being alleged is precisely because somebody watched an ISIS video. They're mad because someone watched an ISIS video, agreed with ISIS, and therefore supported them. That is exactly what they're trying to hold YouTube liable for, is that YouTube just made it possible uh, for more people to watch ISIS videos, and those ISIS videos led to bad results. Um, and the whole point of 230 is to make it possible to watch other people's videos without being held liable for other people's videos. So uh, I don't think the government has the result right, but I think at least the analysis they were engaging in was correct. And I thought the good example that they and others gave uh, was, look, if you have uh, a, an algorithm that discriminates on the basis of race and says, uh, I refuse to show houses in a certain neighborhood to black people because that's a white neighborhood and I refuse to let black people into that neighborhood. And you write your algorithm to say, don't let any black people but you know, see housing listings in this neighborhood. Well, you're being held liable for your, your discriminatory algorithm, not for the content of the housing post. The housing post isn't what's offensive. It's your choice not to let them see it. That in, independently of the underlying content is discriminatory, right? That you are in fact discriminating on the basis of race because you made an affirmative decision that you didn't want black people in the neighborhood. It has nothing to do with the underlying post other than it happened to be about housing but it's not like the post is what caused them harm. It's your choices. So I thought that was an excellent distinction between being held liable for third-party content versus being held liable for your own behavior. Uh, and I think it's a distinction that most people agreed with. I thought the justices questioning it all seemed to agree with. I thought even, even Lisa Blatt for, for Google agreed with it. Um, so from turning to Lisa Blatt, uh, I thought she did a fine job. Uh, she had a little pushback, but not anywhere near as much as Counsel Gonzalez did. Uh, and I thought her opening basically sort of said it all. Uh, are you being held liable for something where the harms flow from the underlying content that wasn't yours? And here the answer is yes, the harms flow from watching someone else's video. They're trying to hold YouTube liable for that and they shouldn't be able to. Now, if and she sort of agrees that there, there's, there's a continuum 
between merely posting someone else's video without any intervention at all, just first come, first serve, whatever is the next video posted goes up on the screen uh, versus endorsing and recommending something because you say everyone should watch ISIS because ISIS is the bomb. Uh, bad pun, obviously, but because ISIS is the best group ever and we're going to have you watch them. That there's a big continuum where I think she suggests that she agrees that that last one, if you say ISIS is great, watch an ISIS video, you're endorsing them, you're adopting them. Uh, and so you can indeed be held liable because now you're being held liable for your own content. It's not merely third party content anymore. You've adopted it, endorsed it, and made it your own. Uh, versus all, all you really did is say, I'm just feeding you more of what you want. I don't give a shit what the what is. I don't care what the underlying content is. I'm not endorsing it. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just giving you what you have, what seems to fit for you. Uh, and I like that, that way of thinking about it. Uh, and here, of course, she said that the prioritization of Google, of YouTube's algorithm has nothing to do with whether YouTube agrees or disagrees with ISIS videos. It has everything to do with who you, the user, are and whether predictively they think this is something that you were asking for, something that you would want, something that you would like. Um, so uh, that was ultimately good. She, like, again, she got a little bit of pushback from Justice Jackson. Um, sort of wondering whether this goes beyond the original intended scope of, of Section 230. I think she did a nice job of pointing out that uh, that view of the original scope is, is, is incorrect. Uh, it was never intended. It was certainly in response to that scenario, but it was never intended to be limited to that scenario. And I thought she did a nice job of pointing out that the purposes of, 27, of 230, as described in the holdings and findings and purpose section of the statute, uh, make it clear that it was broader than that. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, I, I liked the argument. I thought it was interesting. I was encouraged that both the justices, the United States, and uh, Lisa Blatt for, for Google were focusing on the parts of the statute that I, at least personally, think are most important. Now, so the, the last question, the last interesting thing for free speech folks, before we turn to questions from the audience, is, so, so First Amendment, free speech, wh where did that come in here? Uh, and, and the place I see the underlying working issues, again, turns on this notion of content of others versus content of yours. And, and this issue will come up again once we get to the Texas and Florida statutes trying to stop viewpoint discrimination, for example, uh, and, and use that as a way of getting you out of 230. Um, and I sort of think that, look, the, the most protected First Amendment behavior you can imagine, literally making your own video and posting it on YouTube. So say YouTube as an editorial board says, we're going to post a video that says, you know, go Joe Biden or go Ron DeSantis or, you know, yay, ISIS. or so whatever they want to say, um, or boo ISIS for that matter. That is all very self-evidently First Amendment protected speech. But of course, is not protected by Section 230, because Section 230 only protects you from liability for the content of other people, not for your own content. So on the one extreme, highest course First Amendment behavior not covered by 230. On the other extreme, if you did nothing but just sort of made it a public access channel with no prioritization and no editorial discretion and nothing, it was simply you post it, it goes up. We don't help people screen for, for beans. We don't help you with anything. That clearly gets Section 230 protection because that's entirely the content of others. You're not recommending anything. No one imagines that you could be held liable for that. So what do you do about in the middle where you are engaging in some sort of editorial function, whether it's editing for what we think is best suited to our readers, editing for what you like the most, editing for what you think is most interesting in that day, or even editing for viewpoint. What if I run uh, you know, conservatives only YouTube, and so I screen out all democratic videos and I only run conservative videos, or vice versa. Uh, that's plainly viewpoint discrimination, yet it's editorial, yet I'm not necessarily adopting and endorsing the views being stated, I'm just limiting the content, almost like a limited public forum. Uh, and for me, I think that's the interesting category where it is both protected by the First Amendment and it is protected by 230. That 230 protects more than simply passive behavior. 
It protects editorial choice that would also be protected by the First Amendment, even while it does not protect your own personal speech, which is protected by the First Amendment. So for, for those of you here, because you like the First Amendment, those are the interesting questions that underlie this and the interesting questions about where to draw a line and how to think about not just this case, but the cases that are inevitably coming up between the Florida and Texas statutes that are both up, up uh, on cert petitions now. So with that, I will open it up to questions so that the rest of you can hear what you want to hear rather than what I wanted to tell you, and we'll go from there. Well, Eric, thanks very much for that insightful review. Uh, pretty, yeah, I think you did a great job of going top to bottom of, of what just went on this morning and, of course, into the afternoon with such a marathon session. I wanted to start um, with a very high-level question. I think going into the argument, there was much discussion about the algorithm, right? It's the recommendation of additional content that perhaps is what produced the liability. And then we get into the argument and the petitioner talked a lot about these thumbnails. And the argument seemed to be that the liability is a result of creating a catalog. So whether it's the thumbnail or Yes, you searched for this first ISIS video, but YouTube is liable for giving you more, right? For giving you this catalog, the organization of the information. That seemed to be a big part, you know, if not the main part of petitioner's argument. And I'm wondering what you think there about not only that argument, but the kind of difference between the expectations going in of the algorithm conversation and what we got with this thumbnail catalog discussion. Sure. So, so the original version of you recommended it, you're responsible for it, uh, which I think was the way that people assumed this was going to go, had potential, but didn't apply to this case because it's not actually the algorithm YouTube uses. So what, what you're getting at with the recommendation is you're almost getting at an endorsement position, right? You recommended it. You said this is good. You wanted people to watch it. You're, in, you're implicitly endorsing the underlying content, and thus you can be responsible for it in some sense because you've made it your own by endorsing it. And it turns out that that's incoherent given the nature of the algorithm. I'm not saying that other algorithms could do that. They very clearly could. You could write an algorithm, which is just a rule, which said every time you see ISIS, promote the shit out of it because ISIS is glorious. Well, that would be endorsing ISIS. That algorithm would functionally be endorsing ISIS. Um, the algorithm that YouTube uses is nothing like that. The algorithm YouTube uses is largely responsive to the user. Are you somebody who searched ISIS before? Where do you live? Do you seem to watch a lot of ISIS videos? Do you speak in a certain language? Therefore, I should so send you those language videos. Uh, it has nothing to do with endorsement. It has everything to do with, I want my user to spend more time here. And so the only thing that that algorithm sort of says is, you seem to like ISIS. And that's not something that gets liability as opposed to if an algorithm said, ISIS is really good, have another ISIS video, that might get you liability because that's your speech effectively, your content. Uh, so, when, so he had to go to something else because I think he realized that his main line just didn't really work well on the facts of this case, uh, even if it might work on somebody else's case. So he went for the, it's your content because you helped create it, even though you didn't endorse it. And there's a little piece of the definitional section of 230 that says, well, you're an information content creator or an information content provider if you, in whole or in part, created the content. And so he's trying to work on the in part. Yes, there was an underlying video, but you did more than just republish it. You tweaked it a little bit and you put a hyperlink on it and you made the thumbnail. And I think that's incoherent. I think it's literally incoherent and it's especially incoherent when you look at the definitions of what it means to be an information service provider or a interactive software provider, which says you can provide software that cuts, pastes, digests, analyzes, prioritizes. It didn't treat all of those actions as if they were content provision. It treated them as if they were content manipulation, which is something different. Uh, and that's why it's ultimately broke down, I think. Um, but I, I thought he, he had to go there perhaps because his other argument didn't fly very well in moot courts, didn't apply to Google, that he realized, yeah, well, it's a, it's a perfectly theoretically good line. It just doesn't mean he wins. 
it's lovely to have a good theory, but if you don't win on your own theory, that's not very helpful. Yeah, no question about that. And, you know, continuing to pull on that thread that you just left off with there, we heard from several of the justices that they were sort of confused at what the argument actually was. And I, Justice Alito even said, and I think this is mostly verbatim. I wrote this down. I don't want to say it is verbatim, but it's close to what he said. Justice Alito says, I'm afraid I'm completely confused by whatever argument you're making at the present time. And there seemed to be that that muddling. And I'm wondering, you know, you talked about it a little bit, sort of the, the disconnect maybe between a moot court and what actually happened this morning. What do you think got confused there? Uh, I, I think what got confused is he was trying to draw a line between, well, so if I go onto YouTube and say, show me an ISIS video, and it pops up an ISIS video that just starts playing, his theory was you can't be held responsible for that. But if I pop up a thumbnail that requires you to click it before it plays, you can be held liable for that because you co-created the thumbnail. And that's just the stupidest distinction I've ever heard, which is why I think a bunch of people like were confused. Are you telling me that it was the, the little mini clip that was the problem? Or is it the hyperlink that's the problem? So that when you Google something and Google gives you a bunch of answers, each of which is a hyperlink, the fact that they added the hyperlink suddenly makes it their content now rather than the underlying content, all of which makes no sense at all. And so he sort of tried to say, well, by collecting them, by analyzing them, you're engaging in your own speech, forgetting what speech that was. The speech that they're engaging in, yeah, there may be some speech when I say, here's the answer to your question. I am engaging in speech, but the speech I'm engaging in is not the speech of the answer. The speech I'm engaging in is, here's your answer or the speech, here's something you might like, or here's something that seems responsive, or here's something that a million other people seem to like that maybe you will too. I'm saying all of those things, none of which create liability, not even incredibly create liability. What they want is to say, once I've said that, I'm also saying the underlying stuff. And that's ridiculous, which is why it was so confusing because he was muddling the information content with the organizational, the implied message of the organization. And the implied message of the organization was very little. And he was trying to mix them together by having this thumbnail argument that nobody was buying, literally nobody. Uh, sure. So, And, you know, one of the other things is the justices were trying to make that logical connection between the, the recommendation of content. And it seemed to me, I think it seems to you as well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there was pretty broad agreement, not only amongst the justices, but with the advocates as well that the algorithm is in fact neutral. So we can just start there. It's a neutral algorithm. And then the question is, how do we get to aiding and abetting? And my question for you here comes in here, which is he mentioned uh, a couple times, the petitioner, that to the facts of tomorrow's case, the Twitter case, will somehow help us understand how we get to aiding and abetting. I, I, didn't, I didn't see a preview of... of what necessarily he thinks will arise in the Twitter case. But I'm wondering if, if you have any idea of what may occur in the Twitter case that will help establish the aiding and abetting. So I have not followed the briefs in the Twitter case, but his argument suggested that the particular statute includes as one form of aiding and abetting recommending, right? Recommending videos than someone else. He think the statute would indeed cover simple recommendations, regardless of whether they amounted to endorsement. And we'll have to see how that statute is worded. I, I am doubtful that, that aiding and abetting could be read from neutral recommendations, even if you knew that therefore it was going to people who liked ISIS, that somehow merely knowing that somehow made you a, an aider and a better. But he seems to think that the wording of the statute will support such a broad view of aiding and abetting to include even content, you know, viewpoint neutral recommendations. Now, now what I think is interesting, part of your question, you sort of suggested that there was an agreement that this was all neutral recommendations. There wasn't entire agreement on that. There was some debate about what it means to be neutral. 
And I think Lisa Blatt at the end of the day, and to some extent, Malcolm Stewart sort of pointed out that it's not neutral in some abstract sense, but it is neutral as to the content being recommended. It doesn't care if you say, I love Trump, I hate Trump, I love Biden, I hate Biden, I love ISIS, I hate ISIS. It's neutral as to that. It may not be neutral as to, is this a popular video? Because I want to encourage popular videos. So it's not completely neutral, but it is not creating new information content that somehow endorses the pre-existing information content. The only information content such a recommendation or tool would create is it would tell you this seems to be pretty popular. So yes, there's some information content there. The statement that lots of people have watched this is information content. It's just not information content that gets you sued, that even plausibly gets you sued. Uh, it's all you've said was you seem to like cat videos. Okay, that's true. I seem to like cat videos. Sue me for, for sue me for saying for you know go ahead and sue me for having noticed that you seem to like cat videos. That's ridiculous. Um, so that's the debate. It's neutral as to the underlying content, while it may not be neutral in the abstract. And Justice Gorsuch gets to this and points out that algorithms don't have to be neutral. It's just this one seems to be. But other algorithms might not be neutral. And if they're not neutral, that could pose a different question. And with this, I agree with him. If the algorithm somehow is aggressive enough to create new or, or adopt old information content as its own, then you might be liable for that. But once again, it's important, as Lisa says, uh, Lisa Black said, to draw a line between you can have a viewpoint-based website that says conservative views only without having to say, and I adopt and endorse everything every one of these people say. No, you just it's like, again, the analogy I like is like a, 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 a limited public forum where we say this public forum is to talk about COVID. And so you start talking about the war in Ukraine and they say, no, 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 no. This is a COVID forum. Shut up. Go talk somewhere else. Or you say, this is CPAC. We're going to talk about conservative stuff. Or this is the DNC. We're going to talk about DNC stuff. Right? Those are limited forums. They have content restrictions. But that doesn't mean that the organizers agree or endorse everything said. Uh, and that would be protected, in my view. Whereas if somebody stood up and said, we're only going to have pro-Trump stuff or pro-Biden stuff, you would implicitly be endorsing the viewpoint, not merely the content. Eric, I want to switch gears here, um, get a question from the audience. And you, you left off in your initial remarks talking about the states, maybe the way forward in the states. And um, we have an audience member who is asking what your thoughts are on the impact of this case and the argument on attempts by states. So, for, for example, Florida and Texas uh, in their efforts to regulate big tech. Sure. So I, I think it's interesting. Uh, it's that First Amendment interaction problem. So at some point, big tech says, let's, let's hy hypothesize that big tech says, sorry, no, no crazy conservatives on our sites, only crazy liberals, no crazy conservatives allowed. That's certainly a viewpoint based discrimination that, you know, any, any, anybody who hosts a chat room could do, anybody who hosts a website could do, lots of people do it all the time. Does that mean they lose Section 230 protection? And my answer would be no. That doesn't mean they lose 230 protection unless they endorse the particular views of, the, of other people on their sites. Now, let's say Big Tech instead said, I'm only going to run, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prioritize and promote videos that say masking is good, masking is good, masking is good, masking is good. Well, at that point, they've endorsed the message that masking is good. And one could say that their own algorithm is conveying the message that masking is good. So then I get to sue them if it's actionable for saying masking is good. If it turns out masking kills me, and so I'm gonna sue them for having told me to mask when it kills me. Sure, I think that's actionable. I don't think 230 protects them because at some level they've adopted the content they are recommending because that's the nature of their algorithm. Now. A separate question, can, can I for content providers to be content neutral just because they get Section 230 protection? And the answer to that is a First Amendment problem, not a 230 problem. 230 covers some First Amendment protected speech, but not others. It covers editorial decisions, but it doesn't cover content creation by the provider. 
right? That's the clear line 230 draws, which overlaps with, but is not the same as First Amendment protection. So my personal view is the Florida and Texas statutes violate the heck out of the First Amendment, but it's utterly independent of the scope of 230. 230 does not assume a perfectly neutral pipe. 230 assumes plenty of content and viewpoint discrimination. But the more viewpoint and content discrimination kicks in, the stronger the First Amendment interest and the stronger the First Amendment protection. And so I, I think it's not that 230 necessarily trumps those statutes, but I certainly think the Second Amendment, the First Amendment does. Second Amendment too, I suppose, if they used it right or wrong. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question here. Some of the, you know, it was more than one of the justices, but I'm thinking about Justice Kavanaugh in particular, was wondering if the court is the right body to settle this dispute. There was some discussion about whether, you know, I mean, whether it's the Supreme Court or even a lower court. If, if the court, if the, the judicial branch and at any level is who should be settling this or if we should kick it back to the legislature, and I'm wondering your ideas on, on that in, in the uh, sort of the broader uh, discussion. On the big picture question, I think that's undoubtedly correct, that uh, the choices being made here are policy balancing choices uh, with pros and cons on both sides. Section 230 certainly didn't create blanket immunity for everything. It drew a bunch of lines that are admittedly in some instances debatable, but those are quintessential policy choices and their policy choices that are well within Congress's knowledge and, and consciousness right now, there are dozens of bills up on the Hill about these things. And so, yes, I think the court should be reluctant to weigh in on something where Congress is, is there and, and is thinking about it and is debating the pros and cons and how to properly craft the compromise, let's say. However, I thought Justice Jackson made a fine point, which is to say, but, but, where did we? Where did the courts go wrong? Did the courts overexpand 230 because they thought more protection was needed and hence go beyond the original intent of Section 230? At which point, the courts have already put their thumb on the scale in a way that is up to Congress. One of the, one of the maybe it was uh, counsel for Gonzalez who said, look, you're, there's been all kinds of things that happened since 230. And if you think that those things also should be protected in the same way 230 protected other behavior, well, the Congress can certainly do that. But it didn't. It didn't then. And just because there are things that are like that, that aren't covered by the literal language of the statute, doesn't mean that you a court to go out. So I don't know which one is the activist court, right? Which is the court that's stepping in beyond Congress, or which is the court that's reining things in when Congress didn't mean to go that far. So it's hard to tell sometimes which choice is activist. To me, the answer, I know what thumb I'd put on the scale. And the thumb I would put on the scale is the thumb that Congress itself put on the scale in its findings. Congress's findings, I think, to a large degree negate Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's uh, view of Section 230. 230 was there to encourage the internet, to make it expansive, to reduce the risk of, of liability, crushing small and big companies alike, to basically let innovation play its court. And so if you're asked, if, if you're asked, do I go broad or do I go narrow when I'm uncertain? The answer is protection should be broad because that's what Congress wanted. So if you're ever in doubt, look at Congress's enacted intent, not what you think their intent was, not what you infer their intent was, but what they actually put in the statute. And that to me makes the difference. So I would certainly let Congress tear it back further if they want to, but they seem to want it to be broad when they enacted it. And I'd stick with that as a court. Eric, any departing thoughts, final thoughts here? Uh, I'm just glancing at this last uh, question that came in. Uh, I, the only thing I see here is that Justice Jackson and uh, Ted Cruz agree with each other, which is you know notable all, all in itself. Um, but, but I guess my short answer is I think she has too narrow a reading of, of Section 230, that yet Section 230 was was designed to give folks choice to remove stuff, but it's actually worded much more broadly than that. That is not its only purpose. It's one of its purposes, but its other big purposes as enacted by Congress were to let the internet grow, <laughs> let it grow without the risk of liability crushing things. 
Uh, and if Congress wants to slow that growth down or increase liability, or if it correct for some of the, the harms of the wild, wild west, Congress knows how to do that, is, is very interested in it. And I think in a bipartisan way, quite frankly, is interested in it. So I don't see any reason for the court to butt their nose in where Congress is perfectly suited, better suited, in fact, for making those kind of close calls. Excellent. Well, Eric, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I really appreciate your analysis here. And on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank you for sharing both your time and your expertise with us today. I want to thank our audience as well for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Please check out our website, fedsoc.org, or you can follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you all again for tuning in, and we are adjourned.